So as promised, not every field is like the rational numbers. Although the rational numbers have all the properties that we expect other fields to have. But in particular, what's really interesting about fields is that not every field has an infinite number of elements the way that the rational numbers do. There are a lot of finite fields out there in the world. So what we want to do in this video is take a look at how those finite fields can arise, uh, in particular looking at the example that we're already pretty familiar with, and that's the field z quotient by pz. So the, uh, the cyclic group of prime order actually is, with the usual operations of modular addition and multiplication, a field. But what we want to do is figure out how we can think of z mod pz uh, in a way that shows us how fields can arise through taking quotients of other rings besides the ring of integers. So in this video, we're going to look at two concepts of ideals inside of a ring, namely the idea of a prime ideal and a maximal ideal. And then we'll show what happens when you take a quotient by a prime ideal, quotient of a ring by a prime ideal, and the quotient of a ring by a maximal ideal. And it turns out that when we take the quotient of a ring by one of its maximal ideals, that the result is always a field. And this is an important construction that will allow us to generate fields in a more general context later on. So let's take a look at rings, ideals, and how those quotients of rings by ideals turn into fields. We're going to start by just asking the metaphysical question, where, after all, does z mod p come from? So I'll tell you a little story here. Where does z mod p come from? Well, we start with the integers. Right, here they all are, at least a few of them, um, and 0 being the most interesting of all the integers. And z mod p comes from, you know, someday, 0 and another integer decide that they love each other very much, and they get together, and they have a lot in common, and they decide that they can't possibly be apart from one another for any longer. So what happens? They connect up with one another, so 0 and some other integer, and it ends up taking the entire sort of line full of integers and wrapping it around into one of these clock circles um, and giving us a modular group like we were used to when we were talking about group theory. So the idea of what z mod p is is it takes um, it takes nz, or pz, or whatever, it takes all the multiples of a given number, and it kind of sews together the integers from a line into a big loop, a big circle, along that set of multiples of n. So, for example, let's say I take uh, the integer z, and I want to sew the integers together along the set of multiples of 5. So here's the multiples of 5, 0, 5, 10, 15, and so on, including the negatives as well. And then what I'm going to do is identify uh, one object of my quotient, which is represented by all of those multiples of 5. Then we have all the numbers, the integers that are congruent to 1, mod 5. Those all get a separate element of the quotient. Then we have all of the numbers that are equivalent to 2 mod 5, 3 mod 5, and 4 mod 5. And so all told, what we end up with are five elements that are represented by each of the residues modulo 5. Now the key to understanding the arithmetic in this quotient of z mod 5z, the key to understanding this, is really to understand how it is that 5z, so this thing that we sewed z together along, we want to understand how 5z sits inside of z. In other words, how are the multiples of 5 situated inside of the arithmetic of the integers? And a suitable generalization of that is going to be what makes this all run. So the role of 5z, uh, it can really be played in a more general setting by any ideal, any two-sided ideal inside of our ring. Um, and then the role of this clock group, or clock field ultimately, uh, is going to be played by the quotient of our ring by that particular ideal. So first we want to look at what is it going to take for us to take a quotient of a ring and have that quotient be an integral domain. Again, an integral domain is a, uh, is a ring in which there are no zero divisors. So what we're going to do is take the opposite tack and ask, well, what, what has to be true if the quotient of r by an ideal i has a zero divisor? So let's go back to our ordinary clock group that we look at pretty much every day, uh, z mod 12z. And let's talk about its zero divisor. So first of all, it's the quotient of the integers, z, by the ideal 12z. Um, and that has, of course, 12 different residue classes inside of it, arranged around a, a clock in which we, the way that we are accustomed to looking at it. And we know that z mod 12z, when thought of as a ring with modular addition and modular multiplication, mod 12, has zero divisors. So for instance, if I take 2 and 6 inside of my clock group and I multiply them together, 
that in fact, because 2 times 6 is equal to 12, and 12 is congruent to 0, mod 12, that 2 and 6 are actually 0 divisors inside of this ring. But then the question is, why is it that these two numbers, that these two residue classes, if you like, in the quotient, why are they 0 divisors? Well, 2 and 6 are 0 divisors precisely because 2 and 6 in the integers multiply together and land inside of the ideal 12z. And in the quotient, the whole ideal 12z is all wrapped up into the identity element 0. So in the integers, we can land inside of 12z by multiplying from without of 12z. 2 times 6, even though 2 and 6 are not in 12z, their product is. So what's the moral of this story? Multiplication by 2 in my clock group here is not a one-to-one -one operation. Because for instance, 2 times 0 and 2 times 6 are both the same thing, mod 12. 2 times 5 and 2 times 11 are the same thing, mod 12, and so on and so on. So we have different elements going to the same place when we multiply by 2. So uh, that is what's going to give rise to zero divisors. So in this case, the definition we're going to make is we're going to say that 12z, the ideal of multiples of 12, is not prime because there exist two elements that are not in 12z, for instance, 2 and 6, that have the property that their product does land in 12z. And because that happens, the, uh, the images of these two zero divisors under the quotient, the uh, images of 2 and 6 under the quotient, are zero divisors in the quotient ring, z mod 12z. So if we have an ideal that is not prime, the quotient by that prime ideal is going to have zero divisors. And so the quotient will not be an integral domain. Luckily for everybody involved, it works the other way as well. That if I take instead of 12z, let's look at 5z instead, where we have the residue classes modulo 5. 5z will be a prime ideal in our definition. And we're going to say that it's a prime ideal because any two elements from outside of 5z, any two things that are not multiples of 5, when I multiply them together, the result will still not be a multiple of 5. So it is impossible to land inside of 5z by multiplying elements from outside of 5z. And because that's the case, it's not going to be possible for us to have any zero divisors in the quotient. Because if I have zero divisors in the quotient, then their product inside of z would have to have been a multiple of 5. And so if I have one of these ideals that's called a prime ideal, then the quotient will definitely be an integral domain. So the moral of this story is that a prime ideal is, first of all, one that when I multiply elements from outside of i, I never land inside of i. It's not possible for me to land inside of i by multiplying elements from outside of i. And because of that, the quotient by a prime ideal will not have any zero divisors. So the quotient of any ring by one of its prime ideals will always be an integral domain. And that's our first step along the way to constructing a field. As we know, every field is an integral domain, but not every integral domain is a field. So now let's take that next step. What does it mean to take the quotient of a ring and have that quotient be a division ring? In other words, that every element of that quotient is a unit, a multiplicative unit. So in this example, we're going to be more interested in whether or not multiplication in that quotient is onto rather than one to one. So again, let's think about it from the converse perspective. Why might division in a quotient fail? So let's think about the, uh, the situation of z mod 6z. So I've sewn together the integers along the multiples of 6, and then we have 6 equivalence classes here in the quotient. And let's think about the question, what is, in this ring, 1 divided by 2? Well, whatever 1 divided by 2 is, it's going to be an element which, when we multiply it by 2, gives us 1, at least congruent mod 6, right? But when we multiply an element by 2, we're always going to land inside of the ideal 2z, right? Anything multiplied by 2 is going to be an even number. So you can see where this is going, right? It's not going to be possible for us to get something which is congruent to 1 mod 6 when we multiply by 2, because when we multiply by 2, everything is even, and everything which is congruent to 1 mod 6 is odd. So when we multiply by 2, we land in 2z. And 2z is actually an ideal inside of z mod 6z. So this set of three equivalence classes, 0, 2, and 4, actually is an ideal inside of z mod 6z. It's an ideal that's congruent to z mod 3z. And that's significant, that the range of this multiplication by 2 map 
is actually a sub-ideal, or a sub-ring, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's all those things inside of Z mod 6Z. It consists of the uh, residue classes of 0, 2, and 4. And again, this is significant because this range, this range of multiples of 2, is an ideal inside of my uh, clock group on 6 elements. But because it doesn't include the class of 1, I can't divide 1 by 2. Right? So this multiplication by 2 is not on 2, and therefore any element that it misses, like 1, cannot then be divided by 2. So let's try to generalize this if we can. So 6z, the multiples of 6, actually is contained inside of a bigger ideal in the integers, namely 2z. And if I take the quotient of 2z by 6z, what I end up with is a, a, a group of three elements, and that those three elements in our clock group here are 0, 2, and 4. But then if I take the quotient of the entire clock by that subgroup, then I'm going to get something that has two elements in it. One of those elements is going to be all of the multiples of 2 inside of z mod 6z. Those are going to be the things we can divide by 2 and get an answer. But then I'm also going to get a second element. This is everything that's congruent to 1 mod 2 inside of z mod 6z. In other words, all of the odd numbers inside of z mod 6. And those we can't divide by 2. So by having a non-trivial element in this quotient, we've shown that there are some things that we cannot divide by 2, and therefore 2 is not a unit um, in this uh, quotient. So what is it that made this whole thing run? What made it all run is that we could find a larger ideal that 6z lives within. Every multiple of 6 is also a multiple of 2. And so there's a bigger ideal that 6z is contained in, namely 2z. So 6z, the multiples of 6, is not a maximal ideal in the integers. And because that was the case, we could combine the 6z and 2z here and construct a quotient of our clock group z mod 6z by the, uh, the image of the multiplication by 2 map and get something, a quotient, that has a non-trivial element. And the non-trivial element is going to correspond to elements of z mod 6z that are not units. And because we have things that are not units, then we have a uh, not a division ring. Okay, so if we're trying to make a field, we're not going to make a field by taking a quotient by an ideal that's not maximal. Because if we do that, then this quotient is going to have a non-trivial element. And that's going to stand for non-invertible um, elements inside of our quotient. So just to uh, put a finer point on it, let's think about 5z one more time. So again, we're going to sew together the integers along the multiples of 5. We're going to have five equivalence classes to deal with. But this time, the ideal 5z is not contained in the ideal 2z anymore. Not every multiple of 5 is a multiple of 2. And likewise, not every multiple of 5 is a multiple of 3. Not every multiple of 5 is a multiple of 4. In fact, 5z is a maximal ideal. There's no ideal that contains 5z properly, except for the ideal containing all the integers, period. So 5z is a maximal ideal. And because 5z is a maximal ideal, the multiplication map by anything, for instance, multiplication by 2, if we look at the image, then that image actually contains, well, that image is going to uh, project to an ideal inside of this quotient. But the only ideals in this quotient are the trivial ideal and the entire quotient, z mod 5z. So multiplication by 2 is either going to be just the 0 uh, element or it's going to give us every element of z mod 5z. And a quick inspection shows us that, in fact, yes, we can get to any element of z mod 5z via multiplication by 2. So in fact, because, we, because multiplication by 2 is on 2, that means we can always divide by 2 in z mod 5z. Therefore, the quotient is going to have no non-trivial proper ideals when the ideal i is maximal. And therefore, we know that this quotient will be a division ring. After all, division rings and fields in the case of commutative division rings are exactly those rings that have no non-trivial proper ideals. So how do we make a division ring or a field if our division ring is commutative? We just take a quotient by a maximal ideal. So just to get the quick summary out here, knowing something about an ideal tells us something about the quotient of the ring by that ideal. And that correspondence is, it goes both ways. 
So if I have an ideal which is a prime ideal, then the quotient by that ideal is always an integral domain. In other words, there are no zero divisors after we quotient by a prime ideal. Because after all, if I can't land in i by multiplying from outside of i, then in the quotient, I can't land on 0 by multiplying two things that were not 0. And then likewise, if i is a maximal ideal, then the quotient by i is going to be uh, a division ring in general. But if our ring was commutative, then that quotient is going to be a field. So this is our big new construction of how do we make a field. How do you make a field? You quotient a commutative ring by a maximal ideal. And this correspondence is also helpful in the following sense. We know that every field is an integral domain, because after all, every unit cannot be a zero divisor. So every division ring is an integral domain. But then if we go into the left-hand column, that proves for us that every maximal ideal is also prime, which would be a kind of a tricky fact to prove otherwise. But using our quotient characterization, it becomes much simpler. Of course, the shoe does not always fit on the other foot. Not every prime ideal is maximal because not every integral domain is a field. But this still, it gives us a way of constructing fields from any old ring um, just by identifying ideals that have a certain property and passing to the quotient.